of those who have heard about graph database have used them actually? No one? Okay, so I can probably omit the question who's using a graph database in production. If you have used them, it's probably not running production. So, um, fairly new topic, so I started with the very basics. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce myself, of course. Um, as you can imagine, my name is Stefan Abruster. I work for, for New Technology, which is the company uh, that backs the open source development of Neo4j, which is um, the graph database implementation with the, the by far the largest user base right now. Um, most of the slides are shamelessly stolen from my colleague Michael Hummer. Um, yeah, I'm based in Munich, Germany. Um, and uh, when I'm not doing uh, working on graph databases, I spend a lot of time in, my, in our local fire department as volunteer firefighter, and that's why you see this helmet on my head in, 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 uh, in the conference picture. Uh, yeah, that's sh very short introduction. That thing does not work as expected. Yes. So, um, about half forward, or other people would call it the agenda, but in graph database we're dealing with path, so that's why I'm going path here. Uh, I want to first uh, spend a couple of words on NoSQL, what all this stuff uh, is, and give a kind of cartography of, of um, the different implementations, what are differences. Um, I want to give a uh, motivation why graphs are important and why we should um, deal with them. Um, I want to introduce the concept of a graph database and in the following by some important stuff about Neo4j. So Neo4j is, is one of the implementations, in my opinion the best one, but I might be biased here, so sorry for that. And uh, I also want to show a couple of use cases because as I, you just showed up a few hands who have already heard about the concept, um, it might be useful to see what other people do with graph databases to give you an impression what's possible and for, for which um, cases uh, that can be a really good fit. So, um, talking about NoSQL, um, NoSQL is about, I don't like the word to be honest, it's got not only SQL, NoSQL anymore, so it's about matching the right persistence mechanism for the right use case. So it's like a little bit of this, this toy thing here. So, um, um, the, the, uh, so only the, the right piece fits uh, into that one. The child learns this pretty fast, but um, when we go back for roughly 20 years, um, for every problem we have, we used to have a relational database and we hit our data so hard until it fits somehow in a relational world. Um, and in the last couple of years we got away from that, we think we started to think about our data. And that's what NoSQL is about. So NoSQL formally means not only SQL. So that's the official definition. Um, I probably skipped that one. Uh, more interesting is um, how the NoSQL um, ecosystem is, is structured. So I, we try to, to um, paint this uh, out here. So we have um, the most simple data source here are basically the key value stores. Um, they have a key and they have a, uh, for each key we have a value and for most cases the value is more or less opaque to the database itself. Um, the most um, prominent implementations, React, Redis, um, then we have uh, uh, kind of databases that give a little bit more insight in the data, which are column stores uh, like Cassandra, um, and on the other hand, document stores, uh, which are very prominent these days with Mongo and, and Couch. Um, these tend to map again uh, a key to either a column family or, in the documents case, to a document. Um, the next two um, subtypes of NoSQL database are, of course, relational. But NoSQL means not only SQL, so SQL is part of that. I think I don't need to say any word about relational database. I assume everyone knows that concept, right? Okay. Was this a question over there? No. Okay. Um, and the fifth 
category of SAT graph databases. And there was a nice um, write-up um, from a guy called Martin Fowler, which is a, a very prominent uh, speaker and writer. Um, I guess you, a couple of you guys probably know him, right? So Martin Fowler basically um, introduces the idea of aggregate-oriented data storage, um, are key value stores, column and document databases. And he says, okay, these three types of, of databases basically map a key to something. And as long, so they store a kind of aggregate, and the, the, the level how you aggregate this is done during um, the time when you write. The problem with that approach is um, if you want to query your data in another direction, so if you don't follow um, the level of aggregation you have taken as a decision on, on, on uh, writing the data, you need to do computation for, for querying that. And that's why we, pro prominent, but why we use um, MapReduce stuff so often in combination with NoSQL data stores, because we um, to introduce more insight in our data. And in relational and graph databases, um, the, the diff they are completely different from here, so we can we do more query them, whereas in the other types we um, compute our results. Uh, so um, when we, we try to chart a little bit um, the complexity of the data versus the size and see uh, which kind of databases might fit where, <coughs> so the key value stores basically are super great at storing huge volumes of data because you can scale them massively it's super simple because um, the data uh, key value store um, stores is not really connected to other pieces of data which makes that very easy <coughs> um, then we have uh, the column family which has a, a richer complexity but they tend to scale not that good anymore then we have document databases, it's going the same direction. Uh, and then we have relational databases and of course graph databases, which is the topic of our talk. So the graph databases is more about data complexity than about pure size. So if you're talking about multiple petabytes, that's probably then you have to think if a graph database is correct. But if you're in terabyte scale, well we can handle that. A uh, couple of trends in the NoSQL world. So, um, we have a huge increase of the, the amount of data. Um, that's a very uh, quote from, from Eric Schmidt of Google. I think his, his quote is already two years old now. So, he um, said um, every two days they uh, create as much data as they did the whole year of 2003. Oh, that's massive. Um, second trend is basically um, that. Uh, data gets more and more connected. So we think of all the social networks and stuff like that. It's all about the connections, and not only in social networks. In almost every use case, we, um, we want to store more uh, insight in our data. Um, data gets less and less structured. Think about in back well back in the seventies in Germany when you became engineer, you're uh, my goal was to be hired by Siemens and uh, you s worked for Siemens for 35 years when you get to retirement. So there was, in the, this was simple in the relational world, so you have a job, you have a salary, and a start date and end date. These days, well, um, you um, have some jobs in parallel, other times you don't have any job, so um, there's far less structure in, in, in all this kind of data. Um, and of course we have a shift in, in, in architecture. So um, previously we had a lot of monolithic architectures and um, since we need to be more flexible, we want to cover load peaks and stuff like that, so we need to try to modularize things to change them independently and scale them also independently. So these are basically the trends that lead to the reason why we think about our data and NoSQL databases um, were established. Um, so, <coughs> keep that one in mind. Data, com uh, data complexity is a function of size, connectedness, and uniformity. And most, t most times people speak about the big data password. They're only focusing on the size. 
but that's only one aspect of the show. Well, the solution to that, a graph? Yeah. Do <coughs> um, you know who invented graphs? Hmm. Yeah, meet that guy, Leon Euler. So Leon Euler is basically to us what Shakespeare is to English literature. So he was basically just there to annoy students with some crappy stuff they had to learn. Um, indeed, um, the first craft problem in the world. Any ideas? Traveling salesman. Sorry, no. Yeah. How to connect to uh, shore? Two, two shorts in the city of Königsberg. Hey, that defers the first book. Yes. Right. So yeah, right. It's the the problem of the come after the show to me. You get one. Um, so uh, it was the seven bridges of of Königsberg, which was at this uh, point in history uh, part of, of Prussia, and uh, Königsberg had seven bridges. So uh, maybe maybe ah, let's let's briefly draw that. So. Um, so they had, um, there was the river Bregen going through the city, it was somewhere like that. And there was a bridge, I think there was another, it was pretty as well. So we had, let's just try to roll it. So there was one bridge, there were two bridge, three, four, Five, six, and I don't know exactly the, the topology by heart, but um, <coughs> the question was basically when I'm somewhere in the city and I want to go through each and every bridge only once, is it possible that I return to the same place? And um, looks like um, a lot of people in Königsberg tried this empirically, so they just walked through the city for years and they cannot find a solution. Um, Leonard Euler basically um, did some mathematics on that. He abstracted a lot of things and he found basically that this is a graph. So what, what his abstraction basically was that it's from, from, from the uh, scope of the problem, it's irrelevant where you are in this landmass. So this landmass basically shrinks to a, to a point and the landmass is, is we have another landmass, which is the island here. So that is one, two, one, two, landmass three. Uh, in real life, it was five landmass. Uh, it was four. Ah, exactly. So it went like this. So we had here landmass four. And the bridges basically are the connections between the landmasses. So we are here, 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 something like this. Uh, and that's pretty close to what we learned in, in, in graph theory as being a graph. <coughs> we have nodes, uh, we have edges, and we have vertices. Uh, so the theory of, of graphs is, is more than 250 years old and very well understood from a research perspective. A lot of algorithms have been um, uh, proven and, and uh, gen uh, multiple generations of scientists have dealt with these problems. Whereas um, the relational world, relational databases theory is about, well, let's say 40 years old. It was invented by, I think, a guy called Cops, or Cots, Cot, I think Cot was that. Um, and a lot of the other data stores we've seen, uh, column stores and stuff like that, uh, have a history that lasts at least uh, at most 10 years. Uh, graphs are basically everywhere. So um, just as a kind of example, um, that is flight patterns. And by, by just drawing that, you have an impression of what that means. So you probably see here the shape of Africa. That is the, the Arabian high um, peninsula, India, Asia, and well, <laughs> that's Europe. Uh, so just Visualization is also a big thing for, for, for graphs. Um, let's, uh, let's focus on, on in which ca um, areas we, we see graphs. Of course, um, uh, every, everything in relation to politics. Well, think about politics without relationships. No corruption anymore. Wonderful. <laughs> um, 
very obvious transportation. You mentioned the uh, traveling salesman problem. That's a classic graph problem. Um, also, in, in biology, <coughs> um, chemistry, think about uh, the body. The human body can be easily modeled as a kind of uh, graph with several components that are connected, or the brain um, are um, synapses connected to each other. Um, interesting is also that um, a lot of people in, in um, gene research use graph databases because they can very easily model how, how genes are interacting with each other and um, prove some the theories on, on how, how things work. Um, the internet itself is a graph. Think about, um, um, on the one hand side, the hardware infrastructure, you have switches, you have servers, you have data centers, um, and also the logical structure, like um, uh, websites are connected to each other. Um, and of course, the obvious social networks. I think I don't <coughs> uh, spend much on this. That's too obvious that this is a real graph. Um, yeah, the key concept, in, or the, the most important thing in um, graph database is relationships. We know the world is uh, full of messy, incomplete and um, crappy data and we need to store that somehow. And the relationships we use are at least as important as, uh, as, the, um, as the entities that they connect. Um, think about Google. Google has, um, um, before Google was invented, all the search engines uh, tend to use uh, indexing only, so they index all the contents you have, and when you do a search, it just looks up the index data and returns the results. Uh, Google did basically the same, but they added some feature, uh, which is called PageRank. Um, it's a kind of algorithm um, where the um, connection between the sites are taken into account. So if a lot of important sites link to you, you will bubble up in, in, in the search result. Very simple, but super efficient, and I think the commercial success of Google shows this very drastically. I think the market share in, in Europe of Google is, is 90 to the plus, right? Not sure about that. Uh, these, uh, these structures are highly subject to change, so new relationships appear between any possible kind of stuff and are removed as well. Uh, if you compare that to a relational world, introducing a new type of relationship <laughs> means you need to alter your schema. So in a graphy world, relationships are part of the data, whereas in, in relational world, relationships are part of the schema. That's a big thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, typically um, we have want to answer a lot of complex questions um, to our data. So um, we have complex queries and the, the answer of, of our queries are mostly given by how things are connected. Um, for a lot of use cases, locality is, is, a, is a big concept. So we typically, a lot of applications, we don't want to have a kind of global um, inside in our data. We're just interested in what's around that thing. Who are my neighbors? Think about all these geolocation applications. I don't, I'm not interested in what's going on in Japan. <coughs> um, I'm, currently, I'm interested in what restaurants are around me because I don't want to travel to Tokyo for having food. Um, and the, the problem is these, the graph databases are built for these. That's not a problem, that's the solution basically. Graph databases are built for these kind of local queues. Uh, so, in local queries are from a runtime independent of the size of the graph. Um, just as an example, um, categorization is something we need in almost every application. So, think about product catalogs, for example, or something like that. So, how do we do this? Uh, so, we can probably build a kind of tree of classes, stuff like that. Um, and then we connect our product to uh, a category. What happens if more than one category fits? Well, then we have our tree with uh, the products, but the product is connected to multiple points at the tree, which is basically a graph. Um, 
That's the concept of tags. Um, categories, in this case, our model is ease a relationship. So, um, well, um, that here is a book about graph databases. So, graph databases might be a category. Uh, book might be a category. Um, sometimes we also try to derive the categories dynamically from the query. So, on the path, we, we reach a certain entity in, in, in our graph. We can infer a kind of category. That's an interesting uh, thing. So, um, more prominent these days, a lot of big players <coughs> in IT world are talking about graphs. So, Facebook announced graph search some months ago. So, the idea with, uh, with um, Facebook graph search is so I can probably ask Facebook. Um, well, um, what is a, a restaurant? I'm looking for a sushi restaurant in, in Munich, which my friends like. So there are multiple levels of graphs. It's either my, my personal friendship graph, so who do I know? It's about um, geo information, where I'm located, and it's about categorization, the sushi restaurant. So a lot of different graphs are connected together to answer that question. And um, this announcement about graph search was not done towards developers, this was done, done towards the public. So Facebook uses the word graph for, in the public communication, which is really big time. Um, another big player, Google as well. Uh, Google uh, builds the knowledge graph. Um, their goal is to put all the knowledge of the world in a, a huge graph. So for example, um, you see here Leonardo da Vinci. Um, and um, Google wants to enrich their classic search results by some um, results from the graph. So when you search for Leonardo da Vinci, you might get on, on the side some, um, some uh, information about Michelangelo, who was in the same uh, period as, as Leonardo da Vinci. You might get some information about Italy because he lived there. And this information is all uh, fetched from, from, from the graph Google has created. Um, think about um, personal graphs. So that is um, the personal graph of a colleague from uh, mine, Andreas Kolliger. So you have here probably some people he um, know from, from school, maybe some um, people he know from his uh, work, and maybe some people from, from kind of hobby like doing uh, karate or something like that. And uh, well, they are connected. <coughs> so here, for example, is some person that is pretty close to um, his, his work, uh, but also connected to these guys, to, um, people he met at school. Well, and if um, these relationships are important, so for example, if he's at work, uh, he tells his friends, uh, his, his, his schoolmates, well, I'm working now at a nice company, I'm earning millions of dollars, and um, there is a second, there is a connection, it could easily prove that this, that this was wrong. So care about this, uh, <coughs> this relationship here. Um, yeah, so now this was the motivation on why graphs are important in our world. So let's look a little bit more in, in graph databases. So, um, well, graph database is not for charts and artwork. A graph database is basically for storing information that has the structure of a mathematical graph consisting of edges and vertices. Uh, well, you remember structures in um, informatics like linked list, trees, these are all special kind of graphs. A graph is a general purpose structure. Uh, to make it in one sentence, well, a relational database can potentially tell you very easily the average age of the people here in the room, whereas a graph database potentially can tell me who is most likely to buy me a beer after the show. Well, and this is much more important for me. <laughs> you will remember that sentence. <laughs> okay, compare, let's compare a little bit relational world to, to graph world. So, we know um, relational world where we have the table foo, we have a table bar, and we want to connect them together. Well, what do we do? It's, it sounds so natural to us that we introduce another table to connect data. So, we create a join table, foo bar. And we have an entry here. A red one, um, we can, um, which is connected to the yellow ones, which bridges to the blue ones. 
Um, to make this happen, we need to introduce artificial primary keys on our record. And that's why every table, uh, every SQL admin forces you to have a primary key on the table, right? Uh, let's try to convert it to a graph. In a graph database, we have nodes. And we have um, at, uh, relationships in, in between them. So the, the red record here in our food table is basically the nodes. And um, the join to some other piece of data, the yellow one in the here, converts to a relationship. And the target is basically another node. It's that simple. Um, so we're talking here about the concept of a property graph. Property graph <coughs> consists of nodes, as already, as I already said. It consists about, of relationships. Relationships always have a direction. That's super important to know. Um, consider um, th there are cases where the relationship is, where the direction of the relationship is important. Like for example, if a guy loves a girl, it's not does not necessarily mean that the girl loves the boy. <coughs> which is <coughs> simply that concept causes 90% of the trouble in the world. Um, there are other use cases where the direction doesn't uh, isn't interesting from a domain perspective. So, for example, if you build some, some um, logistics network and, well, you have a city in Munich, you have a city in Osijek, and you have a distance in between of some, some hundred kilometers, then the direction might not be interesting. But in, in this concept, we have always the direction. But we can disregard this fact to query when, from a domain perspective, it doesn't fit. Um, the um, relationships always have a type. So, Andreas here knows Tobias. We have here only nose relationship, but you can have an arbitrary number of different relationship types. So he knows someone, he loves someone, he hates someone, or um, he works for a company. Um, then we have properties. So we can store key value pairs on each of them, on, uh, on the nodes and on the relationships. And there is no limit or no schema on that. So we can store any combination of um, of, proper, of key value pairs on, on these endings. Um, an orthogonal concept is indexes. Uh, indexes are used to find start points for our queries. The problem here is if we assume we don't have indexes and we want to find Andreas here in our graph. Um, without indexes, we basically need to look up each and every node. So the blue one, Lars, Andreas, Andreas, Mika, blah, blah, blah. Ah, here's Andreas. Okay, let's take that one. So that's look, this kind of lookup does not scale. That's why there is um, indexes, and indexes can be um, think of being the kind of um, naming service for the graph. And well, oh, sorry, that was cut off. In Neo 2.0, for the first time in 10 years, we changed that model a little bit. We introduced labels. So nodes, um, like this one, may now carry labels. You can think of putting a tag on a node. So to indicate that this node is a person or it's an employee. So you can put tags on that. But that's new in, in 2.0, just to, to already mention because a lot of there are a couple of blog posts already around uh, that topic. So um, looks a little bit different. Who cares? What have we done um, to, um, to um, give you a short um, idea on how a graph database performs differently from relational database? We made an experiment with a social graph consisting of a thousand person. Uh, each of these thousand person has on average 50 um, friends. Or, yeah. And uh, we want to ask our system, is there a path between two arbitrary person on a depth of four, on a maximum depth of four? Um, to, um, of course, we want up caches for both relational and graph database. Um, to eliminate disk I.O. because we don't want to measure our, our hard drives, we want to measure the database itself. Um, the interesting result was basically um, for relational database, the query took roughly two seconds, which is somewhat okay, I don't care. Um, with U4J, we were at um, roughly at two milliseconds, so there's a little bit of difference in between here, but that's not the interesting fact here. 
The interesting thing is we increased the number, the size of data by a factor of 1,000. So we have now a million users. And the query time stays the same. So this is exactly what I mentioned uh, beforehand. The local switches are mostly independent of the complete size of the graph. And this is a kind of local search. You just have two people and you're just interested what, what's around them. Uh, as a side note, we try to run this with a million users in MySQL as well and we stop the query next morning. Uh, to sum up a little bit the strengths and weaknesses of, of graph databases. Um, so uh, the, the, the data model, the, the property graph, is a <coughs> super general model, compar uh, comparable a little bit to relational world, but with differences. It's um, very fast for, for highly connected data, so we can jump from one node to one each members, uh, one each neighbors, roughly a million times per second on commodity hardware like this uh, laptop computer here, per port. Um, querying is super easy. We will see a nice query language later on called Cypher. Of course, there are a couple of weaknesses. Um, <coughs> since the graph is a highly connected structure, it's a super hard problem to shard a graph. My colleague Jim Bravo would say it's NP hard. He's very, very keen on complexity theory, which I don't understand very well. Um, so it's, all, it's really hard to find which parts of the graph to move, move to which machine. And that's why sharding is currently not really possible, uh, but we are working on that. Um, and the second uh, downside of uh, graph database is it requires to do a mental shift. So you need to think about different. And that's the hard part. Um, so whenever you start with a graph project, you sh if possible, should pull in at least for a couple of hours someone who already has some experience with that because people tend to stick too much to their relational thinking. And so how do we query that graph? <coughs> so, well, we query graph, graphs with a traversal. So a graph traversal is basically, um, that is not Cypher, our graph query language. So we basically say, okay, we want to start our query at a node which is found in the people's index with name Andreas. So we're doing an index lookup here to find Andreas, which is that one. And then we want to match from our node Andreas uh, to some other node, to some other node. So we, we look for all nodes that are two hops away from Andreas and we name them friend of a friend and we want to return them. So if that is Andreas, we can go here, the lettuce part, we can go there with two hops, that is part, that, that, and that. And uh, you know here this ASCII art like notation. So it's like drawing um, the structure on, on, on a whiteboard and you just convert that to ASCII art. That's the way how you describe patterns to, to search in a graph. Uh, modeling is also very easy. Think of that, that is a kind of nice domain model, so a little Facebook-like use case. So we have a couple of people here, we have Adam, we have Sarah, they are friends to each other. Um, Adam made a funny photo of his cat, an old cat photo, he shared that photo. Um, Sarah saw this photo, she pressed the like button, and she also sent a comment on the photo. So that is exactly what um, people probably draw on the whiteboard, right? Very simple. So, um, for modeling graph databases, most easy thing is grab a whiteboard, take a pen, and grab someone who understands the problem, and just say, "Hand it, dude." Um, <coughs> then we try to uh, store this in the graph, and it's looking like that. So, it's almost the same picture. So there is no um, there is no conceptual gap between what we store and uh, what we really have. Uh, in, Tudor, in the near future, we would of course amend some labels here as well. Uh, that's how you model, it's that simple. And that's why we don't need a lot of modeling tools or these uh, ER modeling toolkits um, which um, do a lot of um, crappy stuff to, to our data. 
which not to normalize, denormalize, and all all this um, weird stuff. So um, I want to introduce um, U4J. Of course, since we are in a graph database, we have a graph for that. So we are all about food. So a uh, graph database. Uh, new 4 j is a graph database. A graph database basically manages a graph which records its data in nodes. The nodes are connected by relationships. Both nodes and relationships have properties. Properties might be mapped from index. Um, when we want to query the graph, we do a traversal. A traversal identifies paths in the graph um, and gives up some order to, to the nodes. Right. Um, that's also a little bit of the ecosystem around that. Um, I will um, focus on, on the points on the following slides. So that's just a kind of overview. So um, I said we are property free. Um, we are, so now we are schema free <coughs> property graph. Um, as you've seen, that's perfectly for for handling complex high data datasets. Um, a graph database uh, is fully transactional. We have full uh, real asset transaction, which is which is not a big point if you come from relational databases. Well, every relational database has, has full asset transactions, but if you come from other NoSQL databases, that might be interesting because there are databases out there when you try to write something. Well, it tells you it has written, but in fact, it has written to memory. How interesting is that? We're dealing with my my super expensive data here, and that computer tells me uh, he has not written anything to disk. I don't like that. Um, I already mentioned that the traversal speed is roughly one million ops per second. Um, Near J, um, you can run it either an, as a server, which exposes a REST API, or you can run it in embedded mode if you're on the JVM platform. So if you're on JRuby, Scala, Java itself, or any other JVM language, you can very easily run Nu4j in embedded mode. Um, for scanning out uh, Nu4j, there is um, a, a high availability um, function, which um, allows you to scale um, read operations almost linearly. But since it's on the bare metal uh, master slave for application, as I said, sharding is hard. It doesn't scale that. It scales not that good for writes. So in marketing speed, uh, speech, I would say we scale vertically for writes, which means you need to spend fucking more money on your hardware. Uh, uh, whiteboard friendliness. Yeah, that's what, what I already mentioned regarding modeling. So you just grab someone to paint and uh, you grab, you, you grab the, the essence of that and that's the first draft of your graph model. Of course, you will probably refactor your graph model by the way you query it. Sometimes it's not. You would probably, um, if you have some structural information hidden in some, some property value, you might refactor that to make this more explicit and um, decompose it into nodes and, and relationships to make it traversable. And, well, so that's, that's probably our whiteboard picture. And if we, that's how it's in the graph. That's a screenshot from uh, the back admin, which is um, part of Nu4j, um, which creates kind of basic visualization, kind of admin tool for that. And of course, for clearing that, we can use Cypher again. And that Cypher thing <coughs> is what I want to focus on the tutorial tomorrow. So we will have a deep dive on Cypher. We will start at the very basics and make super nice queries. And I'm not sure, um, have you ever written an SQL statement with more than three joins? Yeah. Was that fun? No. <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah, with, with Cypher, um, connecting data and, and clearing connections is real fun. Uh, so, from, from a deployment perspective, as I said, we can embed new for j So, first uh, option is to run embedded, which requires a JVM language or a framework like Tomcat, uh, Rails, Akka. Um, embedded is great for testing, of course, because I don't have, I can build up the whole engine uh, during my test. 
model is basically, well, we have, we have our client which connects directly to the box. It's that simple. Um, you want to see some code, of course, that is now um, some Java code using our so-called core API. So we did create a ref, we create here a graph database instance based on a certain path. So in this path, um, um, database profiles are persisted. Then, of course, since everything is needs to, to have a transaction, before, um, we create a transaction. Then in our graph database, we create a node, we create another node, we set some property on, on the nodes, and then we um, connect the two nodes <coughs> with the relationship. So we create from Steve, we create a relationship to Michael of a given type, and on that relationship we set the property as well, and then we finish the transaction. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Uh, is there any limit on the key value set? For example, if I wish to make something bigger out of it and uh, simply encode in base 64 some kind of RTF content or attachment, how will this uh, affect uh, the DB if I will not use the relational database on the side? Okay. Just the, the vector node okay. uh, key value pair with yeah. some bigger chunks of data. So the question is basically is Neo4j built for storing large chunks of binary data in a property value? Something like that. Yeah. Uh, clear answer no. <coughs> you can theoretically do that, but you shouldn't. So whenever you have, uh, f uh, whenever you want to store raw image data, for example, um, the, um, it's the best approach is to have this in a secondary store like Amazon S3, and then in the property store just the reference to that. Because on storage level, all the properties go in one large file, which means uh, storing multiple terabytes in a single file. Well, um, there are file systems that can handle this, but we do not recommend that. So that's not what a graph database is built for. As you said, NoSQL is about finding the right data store for the right problem. And a lot of use cases um, are hybrids. So where you say, okay, I have connected messy data, but I also have these huge chunks of binary store. Well then, choose uh, two data sets, two data stores, and connect them together. Just because I work in a company, we really work exclusively on non sql we work on models and uh, stuff like that. So uh, this idea kind of look, looks interesting, and yeah. we are looking for ways maybe to migrate to some other non sql yeah. What you can do here is, um, but that's a more advanced topic, so you can extend the OVJ and uh, have a kind of um, way to transparently handle that. So that you do a REST call to upload your huge chunk of data and internally that one um, puts the connected part in, in U4J and the binary part in a se secondary store. So that is doable. Um, do you guys think that was a good question? Yeah. Okay, second book is up to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remind me, I need to ask a question yeah. about your book. <laughs> Actually, I have three. <laughs> yeah. um, so, first question uh, about uh, these lookups uh, for data and traversals. Uh, does direction in influence uh, performance? Sorry, and then Does the direction of the... Uh, the region where you are in the graph. No, no, no. Uh, the direction of the relationships. Does no, that no absolutely not. The direction, the tra um, mm -hmm. it's totally irrelevant in which direction you traverse um, a relationship. So it's the same thing to ask, uh, give me uh, all boy, all girls that uh, you like or uh, give, uh, give me all girls that are liked by me. So it's, it uh, traverses or answers that question in the same time. Yes, the, there is, uh, the, so all, internally, now we're getting very deep on, on storage level, internally um, all the relationships are stored in, 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 a, in a linked list. Mm -hmm. And for example, if I now want to filter, so for, think of, um, there, there's a girl who, who loves two boys for example, but um, she likes, uh, let's, uh, she has uh, written thousands of comments. So we have all the connections of that girl in one list. And if the, this list grows huge, then of course we need to filter out the two relevant first. And therefore, it might be a little bit different. But in general, it's totally irrelevant if you, if you tra travel from A to B or from B to A. Okay. A second question about uh, uh, analog for object relational mapping tools. Uh, does that something like that exist for... Uh, I should be, I think um, I didn't hire you for answer the question, but... He, Answer is on the next slide. <laughs>
But I will, I will use some beer. Um, <laughs> so, um, there are a couple of um, object graph mappings. Um, so most prominent in the Java world is Spring Data Neo 4 j uh, where you have a, a Java domain model, like here we have a movie, we have actor and we have roles, and we place some annotations on that. So that thing should be persisted in a node. Uh, we have a property title that needs to be indexed, and then um, we want to connect our data um, with some, some mapping here. So, um, there is the, the cast is uh, following the x in relationship. Um, we have here an entity that is mapped as a, as a relationship with uh, some star code, some end node. That is one of the um, persistent, where you can have a Java standard domain model with a couple of annotations and persisted that into a graph. Um, the same concept exists basically for Grails. I'm not speaking of Rails, Grails. Uh, I know that very well because I've written that one. Um, there's also some um, stuff going on for a lot of other languages. So we have a lot of language drivers. Um, but I, we need to look up. I'm, I don't know all of them by heart, so there exist solutions for other languages as well for that problem. But you should share, uh, carefully think if it's really necessary to have this object graph mapping. Because the, the, op, the, the graph is basically your object. So sometimes you're better off not doing that. Um, question answered? Yes, and the third one. The third one, <laughs> yeah, yeah, go for it. Uh, do you support uh, distributed transactions? Um, In particular, you mentioned that uh, uh, data for some data is uh, best fixed, uh, yeah. best fit for one yeah, type Yeah, you're speaking storage. about XA transaction managers, right? Yeah, exactly. Yes, uh, you can configure the transaction manager as well. Um, that's a config option where you specify the class of your transaction manager. So two-phase commit is supported? It's possible, yes. Of course, but you have to do some work for that. Okay. So you need to configure a little bit uh, the right class, you need to pull in a different jar file. So there have been uh, people using the Atomkeys, Atom, Atomkeys <coughs> transaction manager. I'm, I'm, I don't remember the name of that uh, very well, but uh, yes. Uh, Three questions from the guy, is it worth the last book? Yes. Okay, third book is for you. So, no books anymore, but I'd love to hear more questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, what is the summary for tomorrow's uh, workshop? And are there some very conditions for it? Can you repeat that? Uh, what is the summary for tomorrow's workshop? The summary of the workshop will deal about Cypher. So, uh, we want to install Neo4j on our machines, and we I want to introduce um, um, a little bit of data modeling. We want to go through Cypher, how you, how you um, insert data with Cypher, how you query your Cypher. That's basically the scope of that. So it's very much hands-on. Uh, yeah, so, um, well, that's Cypher language. So in Cypher language, you basically, um, it's a declarative approach. So um, you specify what you want to have and leave it up to the engine to deliver the results. So we don't compute our results, we really query that. And the query, so we have here these nice patterns, as you've seen previously. We can also do some, some aggregation, like count, sum. Um, it's super powerful, and we have seen a lot of people uh, using Cypher which are not software developers. So the classic... Um, business analyst who is skilled and he knows the problem domain, you can train them very easily to write their own cipher statements, which is really interesting. Um, we can create the um, uh, stuff with cipher, so it's a create statement. We will see this tomorrow in more detail. I just need to, I'm running short in time, so I need to speed up a little bit, sorry. Um, so the, the second approach working with Neo4j, um, aside from embedded, is using the server component, which is also the recommended way these days to deal with it. So the, the server exposes a REST API, which on the one hand side is very robust, where you can create nodes, set properties, <coughs> so you have very granular of, uh, pieces of functions that you have. Um, but you can also send Cypher code to um, Cypher statements directly to the, to the server via REST. Um, the, uh, the, the server allows very flexible deployment scenarios because, for, um, so if you want to scale out and you have, let's say, um, 
five Tomcat instances running on two versus two Neo4j instances. So you don't have um, one graph database instance per Tomcat. You can have a different scaling on, on database and on, on application server level. Um, there are also a couple of um, cloud managed providers for that for um, the REST server, namely Heroku and a provider from Spain, GrapheneDB, which provide hosted Neo4j environments. And of course you can run it on your own server or on Amazon EC2 or whatever. Uh, yeah, so you have your, your client clients accessing your application server, which accesses the database, which is the classic pattern we know for decades. Um, regarding language drivers, we have a lot of stuff. Um, so JavaScript, .NET driver, some Ruby stuff, Python, Erlang, uh, Node.js. So there's a huge variety. Just go on Neo4j org and see if your language is supported. If your language is not supported, um, well, it's it's basically REST only. So you just need to have a language that is supposed to speak REST, which these days all languages do. I think there is a language called Brainfuck who doesn't support REST. Right, okay. You know Brainfuck? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so um, the, the capabilities when running server versus embedded is almost the same. So they have the same scalability, they have the same transactional behavior, and the same availability. So you can run embedded as HA deployment as well. <coughs> uh, so, uh, so I think I'm going to skip that section since I'm running short on time and show a couple of use cases. That's what, what we do tomorrow. Yeah, so uh, we have a couple of people using u for in a commercial deployment like Cisco, for example. Um, they have a lot of systems um, they use for, um, for customer service. So they have knowledge base, they have some bug databases, they have a record of uh, support tickets that are open. And u for um, basically creates a layer on top of these systems and connects them together. The idea is here that um, more uh, requests can be handled automatically and don't need the manual interaction. So they want to save some money on the support side of that. And uh, what these guys have been doing, they would play, um, um, they do now real-time recommendations um, for the customers with that. That's a pretty big project. Um, another project at Cisco, uh, which is about um, bonus um, distribution, so whenever there is a sale going on at Cisco, there's a super complex system, so the sales rep uh, gets some bugs for that, the boss of the sales rep gets some bugs of that, the, the country organization gets some bugs of that, and this heavily depends on the type of product and also on the region. It's a huge complex um, rule set there, and um, they previously they had the system running on an Oracle <laughs> application cluster, and this kind of previous take took minutes. And uh, since they were on new 4 j they are basically going down to milliseconds for these kind of periods to, to do the calculation for it. And they also do some, some kind of impact analysis. So for example, what happens if we, if we raise the price of this product um, by 50%, what happens in the system? Um, it was a nice um, project. Yeah, and that's um, it's also a nice project we did together with Accenture. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to say the name of the, the final client, but it's one of the largest uh, German um, delivery, parcel delivery services. Um, we don't have that much large uh, uh, delivery services, but I'm not allowed to say the name. So, uh, <coughs> and they're doing, um, whenever there's a parcel scanned um, in, in the menu you send it in, there's a um, it needs to identify the route that parcel should take. And so um, parcel is scanned and then a couple of milliseconds later we need to know the path which it should go, so should it get to the right or to the left side and so on. And um, that is now done with Neo4j with them. And we are uh, basically doing a delivery of, of 5 million parcels per day and um, we need to have a peak of I think 5,000 calculations per second which we run on a four instance cluster, sorry, six instance cluster. Um, the idea is um, in the next stage of the project they want to um, make their physical infrastructure as more, more flexible 
and um, have complete different delivery um, setups for weekends like weekdays or if there is during Christmas period um, uh, they have probably higher 50% more to get work done. Uh, funny side note with that, these guys um, it was I think December the 20th 2012 we get an incident from them so well we fucked up the database there's something wrong um, and it was a real bug that we've done um, the, the call get in at 4 p.m. at 4.30 we, we knew what, what the problem was at 5.30 we had a, a hotfix for them and at 6 p.m. system was up and running again and we basically saved Christmas for Germany <laughs> That was, this was, it was a very stressful thing, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Any good price? What? Any good price? Or? Sorry, me? A good price for that? Or? Well, it's a support <laughs> contract and um, our sales guys are doing a good job. Okay. I don't want to go deeper in that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but my, my thing, I'm able to fill up my fridge regularly. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, also a very nice use case is a glass door. My story is about doing job recommendations. So um, the first um, um, set of, of job search engine just used um, some indexing and well, if you're written in your resume, I hate Windows. I really hate that shitty thing. Um, well, when they do just um, text indexing, oh, that guy has Windows in his resume. Let's send him to some Windows job. Yes, that happens regularly. Uh, this was the first thing. The second um, generation of these, um, of these uh, <coughs> search, uh, pay sites basically tried to rank certain skills. Well, I'm, I'm super good at Java development, I have no clue on JavaScript and so other stuff. And then you can match the profile rather good. But what Tesla is doing, they add another social component to that. The idea is basically, well, if you're a skilled JavaScript developer, it's most likely that around you are skilled JavaScript developers as well. And even if you probably don't want to change a job, maybe one of your buddies would want to. And the same on the, on the job, on the provider side as well. So they have this social component in here. And these guys are storing half of the Facebook social graph in a single instance. Which is massive. That's probably from the number of nodes, the largest deployment we have. Um, I'm really running out of time. I have a couple of more slides, but I think I just want to skip them. You have some, some break and need to probably go over to for another talk. So at that point of time, well, I'm almost done. I have three big books out there. I hope you like the show and um, I would love to see a couple of you people for the um, tutorial tomorrow. Any questions left? We have probably a couple more minutes. <laughs> okay. <coughs> You mentioned that with, with the so okay, Mrs. Kyoto, things like that, you have to have primary keys. Yeah. And you are forced to do it. But how do you get around here? We don't need any keys. But let's say in your examples it's easy to use Andreas because you have three people. But if there are 57 Andreas, how do you know which one? Uh, well, of course, you, you store properties. So you store maybe uh, Andreas, his first name, and, uh, his last name, and his birthday. If, of so course, you if you. You still have three of those. Yeah, well, uh, if you have a kind of customer ID, you can store this as a property, but you know, we, we are not forcing you to have that. If from a business perspective you have, for example, customer IDs, well, please store them there. There's no, nothing wrong with that. But it's, it's, uh, it, the, uh, the uh, primary key in a rational world is normally has no, no, no semantics. It should be completely artificial, right? If, you, yes. if your primary key has semantics, then you're doing something obviously wrong. Um, but in, in relational world, the keys are just used to join the data sets. In a relational database, I just ask the node for the relationships. So I go to the so node and say... To find the first index, right? From where to start. Right, and my first look up... You describe it then in, in you know, like 17 ways just to get the starting point. Instead of just saying, yeah, this is the ID group. Yeah, of course, if I know the customer ID, I can... Always, it's always the case in, in whatever I'm looking yeah. at. So, so, so I would have to describe the customer in... As right, so you should say, I, I want to look for a customer whose name is Andreas, which last name is Kolleger, which has a birthday, um, and then I find potentially five nodes, 
and then I can even start a traversal at five nodes in parallel to narrow down. And then I probably get all the girlfriends of all Andreas colleagues in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Guys who are, don't forget your books.